YouTube fan community, Roger Daltrey fans, random people on the internet, my name is Giggins, and we're here today to talk about Roger Daltrey's 1987 album, Can't Wait to See the Movie, released on Atlantic Records. Now, this album over the years has definitely gotten its fair share of hate and criticism, and it's understandable, it's definitely something completely out of his normal range of music. Um, you know, mixing Roger Daltrey's really awesome, talented rock vocals on top of super heavily produced 80s pop rock has varying results. Um, and it's definitely something I feel warrants its own review because it's really a one-of-a-kind thing for him to have done something like this compared to his other solo albums before and after this came out. So, by 1987, you know, The Who had been broken up for a few years. Roger had really proved himself as a really confident actor and putting out decent solo albums like the one before this, Under a Raging Moon, which is a fantastic album, um, featuring After the Fire, written by Pete Townsend, and then the title track written about Keith Moon. Um, but that song really, it, it's an unbelievable song. It's got all you know, the long drum solos at the end from a myriad of different, different drummers. Um, and the album itself features a lot of really confidently sung songs that even feature some screaming and yelling, like classic Roger Daltrey. It's a great rock album. And after that came out, The Who got back together and did Live Aid, and John Entwistle actually suggested doing Under a Raging Moon as the song that they were going to do. Pete kind of said, no, no, let's not do that, and they did Won't Get Fooled Again instead. But, um, you know, I think that kind of shows that even Roger's solo albums were strong enough to be considered as a song that The Who can perform. Um, for Live Aid. I thought that was pretty cool. So, Roger's next approach was wanting to do something a little different. He wanted to do something more mainstream, a little more pop rock, radio friendly, um, with a whole different approach. He wanted to use drum machines and lots of synthesizers and go for that late 80s pop sound. And um, it's definitely a mixed bag of emotions and feelings and even sometimes genres. <sighs> Alright, let's uh, let's try to talk about this album. He co-wrote two of the songs in the album. He co-wrote Balance on Wires and um, Take Me Home. And one of the songs on here, Lover Storm, was actually co-wrote with Gary Usher, who of the Beach Boys fame. So I thought that was a pretty cool uh, combination. But this, the album itself really does, I think, warrant its own review. It's one of a kind. It's something that he definitely didn't do before and definitely didn't do after. So for that sense, I think it's unique in Roger's discography to, to kind of mention and um, discuss. So the first song on here, Hearts of Fire, it, it instantly brings out the 80s-ness and the overproduction and the sterile sort of approach to song presentation. Um, it's not a bad song, and it, it, I kind of like the story behind it, you know, mentioning the summer of 64, then the summer of 72, and, you know, figuring out who you are, being yourself, um, really not a bad song, it's just, you're, you're, you're introduced to this whole world of, okay, this is Roger Daltrey singing on top of a drum machine, with lots of big, punchy 80s synths underneath it, so, not terrible, but you're getting, like, these, um, bright, Phil Collins, Eric Clapton-esque horn sections of the time, and it sounds like either one of them could have sung this song with no problem. Um, but, I mean, Roger does sing it confidently, and that's kind of what saves most of this album from its uh, slightly stifling production. But the next song, When the Thunder Comes, um, again, more punchy synths, more twinkling 80s guitars, um, the drum machines, and again, Roger sings it confidently, and assuredly then it it really comes across as like you want to hear more because you like Roger's voice you know it's a talented guy it's a good head bopper of a song not too bad ready for love this is where the album for me starts to have a shift in how I wanted to listen to the rest of it or if I wanted to listen to the rest of it um, big chanting chorus you know kind of a gang vocal type chorus it's pretty catchy but the lyrics on this song kind of stifle it it's it's a move that I feel gets repeated throughout the rest of the album with slightly trite lyrics and um, subjects that are a little beneath him to sing about because there's so much more we can expect from this guy, you know? Balance on Wires, 
is the song that he co-wrote on this album and easily I think my favorite song on the album because it's a lot longer and there's room for it to breathe and grow and expand and it has several shifts. Like, there's an interesting you know, early part of the song features like these gurgling synths underneath a, uh, like, uh, a wash of drum cymbals and it creates an atmosphere and his voice is really confident and subdued and it, it just works. And then the song breaks in the second half to this big heavy rock riff kind of feel and um, it just really captures your attention because all of a sudden Roger's on fire again. Like here he is singing on top of this big rock guitar and you're like, yeah, that's what he's supposed to be doing. Like that's where he fits. Like that's where his range is supposed to go. He's not supposed to sing over a computer. Like he's supposed to sing on top of a big guitar sound. And that really works. The next song, Miracle of Love, closes off side one. And it's definitely a catchy chorus, but it's not something that I would like go back to listen to. Um, Again, the production for me kills it. It's um, It leaves you kind of feeling like, meh. But the chorus is good. It's definitely memorable and it does stick in your head. And maybe that was the intent. You know, most good pop songs try to go for that. Side 2 opens with a song called The Price of Love. And um, here we start the nonstop rampage of saxophones and cheesy 80s horns on top of everything. Um, you know, it's not a terrible song, but it just comes across as skippable and kind of cheesy and, again, beneath his talent, beneath his caliber of what we know he can do and what he's capable of. The heart has its reasons. Um, more saxophone. The the bass is really prominent on this song, so that's kind of cool to hear something a little different because every song before this is focused so heavily on the sax or the synth, so to hear some bass is pretty cool. But... This song is so cheesy. Um, the lyrics are so mediocre for him. They're too pedestrian, middle of the road. I mean, his voice is so brilliant, but it's like watching Rembrandt fumble around with a box of broken crayons. Like, this super talented guy is marred and stifled by art that is way beneath him. He's better than this. And it's disappointing to hear something like this album overall because you know what he can do. I mean, just my opinion, just my opinion. Alone in the Night, um, just the title alone is predictable and lets you know what the song's gonna be about. It's these lyrics that are kind of like half-assedly written and um, all the synths in the world couldn't save this one. I'm really not feeling this song at all. Lover's Storm, this is the one that Gary Usher co-wrote. Um, and lots of slap bass on this one, but again, the lyrics just don't do anything for me. It's not a terrible song, but it's nothing I'm going to return to to ever listen to. And then the last song, Take Me Home, this is the one that Roger also co-wrote. And this is one of the weirdest songs on the album. He kind of sings with like this low-range growl. Um, it's got this weird acoustic guitar on top of a slap bass and a drum machine. Um, but it sounds like it was all recorded inside a cave or something. Um... You know, his, his lyrics, uh, the lyrics on this song are kind of like um, about being stranded and figuring out your life, I guess. But uh, the, the pan flute synths on this song are so, <laughs> they just don't translate well. Um, it's got these like weird Looney Tunes horn sections and it's, it, while it, it leaves little to be desired, it's definitely the most interesting song on side two. The choruses just have a weird melody, weird harmonies. Um, yeah, that that song sticks out only because it's so weird, I guess. And I use the word weird loosely. It's It sticks out in a weird way because it doesn't sound like the rest of the album, whereas like every other song on the rest of this album, beyond Balance on Wires, could have been on the radio as a pop hit at the time. Oh, man. This is what uh, the back of the album looks like. I do like the album cover. I think the album cover is cool. Um, you know, I think that's cool. But, man, overall, um, overall, Roger Daltrey's performances shine best when the music is crafted with heart and soul and the lyrics are meaningful, deep, and intelligent. Um, it's easy to say that his talent is wasted on an album like this, but the proof really kind of is surface level. The album is inundated with songs, production, and quality that is beneath him. Um, 
he's better than this. He's just better than this. I understand in life that you need to take risks with your career um, to fully realize your potential. And for that, I'm really proud and glad and happy he did this just to kind of see where he can go, um, just to prove to himself he could try something different. And that really holds a lot of weight because it shows that his desire to push himself and stay creative and relevant was very strong. You know, and that he still wanted to prove himself, even after already having proved himself for years with The Who, being one of rock and roll's best singers ever, best frontmen ever, um, that he still wanted to do something different and see where he can go and see how the audience would take it. Um, you know, his solo works have always been a little hit or miss, but when the guy who belted out Love Rain Over Me puts out a new album, I think you owe it to yourself to check it out because... You spent so long listening to this guy sing the amazing words of Pete Townsend and believing every single word Roger Daltrey sang because what he was singing about was real and heartfelt and the stories were all interesting. Um, but this album is just... It's strangled by drum machines and pan flute synths and cheesy horn arrangements and while and bad lyrics, but like, while it's not a terrible album, it's just kind of disappointing, because you know what he's capable of, and you know what he can do, and while it's respectable that he tried this, and obviously he didn't really follow through with a sound like this ever again, it's interesting that it exists, because it shows that Roger was always up for doing something different, something new, and not getting stuck in his own ways or resting on his laurels, and for that, that's respectable, even if the results are kind of mixed. So, overall, I'm feeling like a 4 out of 10 on this thing. Again, it's not terrible, it's just slightly disappointing. <laughs> it's like, I mean, oh man, this this is Tommy. Like, this is, it's Tommy. Oh boy. Anyways, I think that's all I've got on this one. Not a terrible album, just not the best. He's definitely got other albums like Under a Raging Moon and Mick Vicker are really good. Um, and even that's kind of who like, but anyways, my name is Giggins. This has been Album Reviews with Roger Daltrey. Can't wait to see the movie. Can't wait. I'll wait a little bit. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.